and welcome everyone. Um, the water is, unlike the Pacific Ocean, I'm going to take the water as being warm. Um, Pacific Ocean off the coast of California, um, Central California anyway, is uh, rather chilly. Well, yeah, ocean, you know, not lake. So welcome, everyone. Thanks for uh, showing up here at Science Circle. And uh, my thanks to our uh, hosts for organizing this. So the theme is, um, this isn't your grandparents' climate, that there have been changes over uh, the years. We're no longer in the pre-industrial climate. Jasim, how do you uh, normally handle questions? I mean, I'm okay with people asking them. So. so we're here on the Earth, a small rocky planet orbiting a main sequence G2V star. We normally call it Sol. Um, near the rim of a spiral galaxy, the Milky Way. And sitting there in space. Um, the Earth orbits around Sol, absorbs energy from the Sun in the UV visible wavelengths. And then, if nothing else happened, the Earth would start getting as hot as the Sun eventually. But avoiding that, the Earth emits energy to space in the infrared, long wave. And the um, The two occurrences, the sunlight coming in and the infrared radiation going out, um, are separate enough that uh, in modeling it, they can be treated separately. The uh, infrared is generally taken as longer than four micrometers in wavelength. I like this um, quote from uh, Marshall Shepard, who is a, is a past president of the American Meteorological Society, and um, stated, weather is your mood, and climate is your personality. And uh, it takes a while to learn a person's um, personality and it takes a while to figure out what the climate is whether you just sort of have to you know, can walk out the door and look up and uh, notice it's that it's raining and sure enough it's raining here well I'll get into that global warming versus climate change along the way. Um, global warming is generally taken as a single num uh, number. The uh, global annual average of the temperature change. So it's easy to plot as a trend, yes. Uh, whereas climate change is includes everything um, beyond that single number, including a geographical uh, distribution of heating and all the things that the heating causes. So 
So the business of the Earth, in many ways, is to um, balance energy, to uh, absorb energy from the sun, and uh, reflect some of the energy the sun gives us back into space. But Oops. Okay. Thanks for letting me know. Um, so the, the Earth is basically um, a system of energy balances. Uh, we receive energy from the sun. Partly some gets reflected back into space. But 67 watts per meter squared is absorbed by the atmosphere, and 168 watts per meter squared is absorbed by the surface. The Earth emits, surface of the uh, Earth emits radiation, infrared radiation. Um, reflect some of it back from the atmosphere, but what makes it out is 235 watts per meter squared. Mm. Think of the Earth uh, as a disk, as a G. So, the, um, the radiation that actually comes in is in the facing disk of the planet. Yes, it's allowing for the inclination and that part of the Earth's surface is blocked by the rest of the Earth. So, 200, about 235 watts per meter squared of infrared radiation goes out to space. And, you know, when things are in balance, it just happens that 67 and 168 add up to 235. So, this is pre-industrial um, Basically, the heat from the Earth's core is insignificant. It's way down there. Remember, these are numbers per meter squared. We should um, be grateful for natural global warming. Um, basically, carbon dioxide is emitted from volcanoes um, at a slow rate compared to what we're doing now um, by human efforts. Um, And then the carbon dioxide is absorbed by weathering of rocks, uh, making carbonate rocks, and by um, sea creatures with shells that make a carbonate shell later die and the shell um, ends up on the ocean bottom.
An interesting feature of Earth um, is the emission of infrared radiation depends strongly on the temperature, and strongly being the fourth power of the temperature. And the uh, effective radiating temperature of the Earth to balance the absorbed energy from the sun is minus 18 degrees. Um, that, that's kind of chilly. Remember, that's the average temperature. Um, it would mean a lot of places we live in would be totally too cold. Um, but the actual surface temperature that we experience on average is about plus 15 degrees centigrade. So there's a, a 33 degree difference between the effective radiating temperature of the Earth and the surface temperature of the Earth. And that is a natural balance of carbon dioxide and methane in the atmosphere, pre-industrial. Um, and there's no physical reason to infer that the warming of CO2 is going discontinue uh, at the pre-industrial level as we pump more and more CO2 into the atmosphere. We're historically living because of the CO2 and methane, and um, we may find ourselves uncomfortable uh, because of our changes. So water, we seem to have some water here today, but water in the form of water vapor is a stronger greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide. But the concentration of water vapor that's in the air um, depends on the temperature and carbon dioxide and methane, because they don't precipitate out, um, <coughs> act as control knobs on how much water vapor is in the atmosphere. Um, Lasis and colleagues did a uh, um, simulation of what would happen if the CO2 and methane were instantaneously removed from the atmosphere, but initially leaving uh, the water. And in 50 years, the planet had cooled to um, average temperature of minus 21 degrees centigrade, and there was virtually no water vapor in the atmosphere. Yes, with a, the the temperature of as the uh, carbon dioxide moves the temperature up a notch, um, more water vapor can exist in the atmosphere, and that water vapor is a stronger uh, greenhouse gas. So that if the temperature went up by three degrees, which is um, similar to what's um, expected from doubling carbon dioxide, two of those degrees would be due to the extra water vapor. And more violent storms, um, when it gets warmer, you have um, a heat of evaporation of the water off of the warmer oceans and the warmer air. And that is um, latent energy that, um, as the water vapor condenses, it liberates that energy back into a storm. And so more water, more energy. This is a a simple analogy of what's going on. Um, to get us the uh, greenhouse effect. Um, if you put a light in the bottom of a cylinder of water and look down, um, you know, 
with just the water, there's no problem. You see the light sitting on the bottom. But as you start to add ink into the water, squeeze an octopus or something, um, in order to see, continue to see the light, you have to move the light up. Uh, that sort of, um, you know, obvious to people with a, a cylinder and light. And it, by the time you add a lot of um, ink into the water, you can only see the light if you've moved it up a fair amount. Um, I'm hoping that makes sense. So the same thing happens in the atmosphere. Um, the CO2 is a strong absorber, and when you add more CO2, the altitude from which the atmosphere radiates to space, or conversely, from which a satellite can see down to us, um, also pre uh, increases, just like the, the cylinder. Um, and in the troposphere, the higher the altitude, the colder it is. And colder means less energy is radiated to space. Back to that uh, fourth power of temperature. Um, to get that emitted energy back into balance, because now the Earth, as you add more CO2, is emitting less energy, you have to warm up the new altitude from which radiation goes out to space. Um, and the temperature at that altitude is tied to the surface by convection. And that's basically the physics for global warming in a nutshell, that you increase CO2, you raise the altitude, um, from which the atmosphere can see space, it's colder there. And that means less radiation is going out, but the same radiation is coming in in the terms of sunlight. And that means the Earth is taking on more energy than it's emitting out. And in one sense, that's the definition of warming. It may not always be temperature that changes. Um, but um, that's the global warming effect. And um, you can uh, search on that in terms of some of it's kind of the effort of um, putting that energy in terms of cat sneezes as a unit. Now, it was known much earlier that carbon dioxide um, absorbed infrared radiation. But starting in the 60s, the Air Force um, cataloged all the absorption lines of CO2 and other gases. Well, it depends on the particulates, uh, Vic. If they're um, sulfate aerosol, aerosol means small particle um, in the atmosphere. If they're sulfate in aerosol, they tend to reflect um, sunlight, and um, the air cools a bit. Um, if they're carbon particles, then they tend to absorb sunlight and energy. Um, and that would tend to, to uh, heat the atmosphere. Sorry if my voice is a bit scratchy. I uh, was on travel and uh, to a conference a week and a half ago and came back and immediately came down with my travel cold. It doesn't take a, a climate model, a full climate model, to estimate global warming. 
uh, back in what's become a, a classic paper. Um, back in 1967, Suki Manabe and Dick Weatherall used a one-dimensional. Right? So it's global average, but has varies in altitude. It's got a whole altitude profile. A radiative convective model, which means that it handles sunlight and infrared radiation, and it um, convex air up when the atmosphere becomes unstable. Uh, the density um, allows the uh, upwelling radiation. Uh, same stuff that holds up gliders in the atmosphere. Um, they were able to calculate um, a change in average surface temperature from doubling the concentration of uh, CO2 uh, of about 2.4 degrees. And probably two-thirds of that is due to the water vapor that is added to the atmosphere um, as the CO2 warms it a bit. And that number is still solidly within current estimates on the um, effects of global warming. We also noticed a signature of greenhouse gas warning that the troposphere warms because more radiation, more infrared radiation gets trapped within it like a blanket, um, and a cooling stratosphere because if less radiation is escaping the troposphere, then there's less radiation going through the stratosphere and that basically cools it. So that signature matches observations. Um, you wouldn't have that signature from um, a uh, more active sun, for example. Um, and that, that supports the idea, um, as well as with other physics, that the uh, um, carbon dioxide is causing the warming. No, I'm uh, not familiar with uh, Eunice, and that's unfortunate if she did uh, do the experiment and uh, not receive the recognition. I'd be uh, interested if, well, I can look up the paper myself, but uh, would be interested in that. Thank you, Tagline. So, going away from the um, the physics from a, a moment and um, how that um, motivates glo or global warming, um, we also have observations and analysis from a number of groups now um, on observed heating, um, both from using um, tree rings as a proxy for temperature. And um, after 1960, uh, more direct readings. Basically, the tree ring temperature followed observed temperature from about 1880 um, until about 1960. And around then, um, there's emerged a problem that in the literature is called uh, the divergence. Uh, it was published in the 90s. And basically, some of the tree ring data at um, high latitude stopped following the temperature. Um, you know, that could be due to um, 
acid rain um, or something else affecting uh, the tree growth. It was known at the, uh, prior to the first analysis by Michael Mann um, in doing a temperature sequence like this. And um, he merged the two data things, uh, taking the tree data up to about 1960 and then merging into observed temperature when the, uh, um, there was less certainty about the tree data. Yes, there's a, for instance, a whole, uh, a very nice history um, done by the American Institute of Physics on global warming. I'll uh, um, try to find that at the end of the talk. So both the physics and the observations um, I think they took, it will, uh, depends on the base period uh, they took. And um, I think they took a more recent base period of um, somewhere around 1900 to 1960. An anomaly is basically um, where you subtract off a um, base period to um, give you better um, numerical precision. You don't need to carry on the large number um, and do the whole analysis on that. So. Um, it's often done in terms of an, of an anomaly, meaning the variation from something taken as the base, uh, as the, uh, base value. Now I did give the link at the bottom. Um, to the Berkeley Earth Org organization and um, from which I took the graph and their analysis and papers are online so uh, that information of what they used as the base period would be there. And in the early phases we have, well, we still have, um, we have natural variation from volcanoes. We also have large uncertainties um, in the data. So beyond the observations of temperature increase and the fairly basic physics um, that I started with that um, points toward greenhouse gas warming, um, the total solar irradiance is measured from um, orbit and has little variation and if anything is at a minimum. So 
it can't be blamed on the sun. The heating can't be blamed on the sun. And currently the eccentricity, that's the how elliptic the orbit is versus circular, um, is low and heading for a minimum in about 25,000 years. Um, cutting out climate change as a source of orbit of um, from orbital forcing that um, in times when the orbit is much more elliptic and it changes because of the uh, pull on the earth from Jupiter and Saturn primarily um, when the earth is more eccentric uh, you can run into conditions where the northern hemisphere summer isn't sufficient to melt the snowfall from the previous winter and you know over thousands of years that accumulates into ice sheets um, which has been the basic mechanism of climate variation um, historically it historically meaning in millions of years And um, either a change in the sun itself um, or warming due to orbital uh, parameters, which basically um, also change the amount of sunlight arriving at the Earth. Neither of those would have the signature I mentioned of tropospheric warming with stratospheric cooling. Steve Easterbrook, um, who's a, a, clim uh, a computer scientist at the University of Toronto, um, embedded himself with the, the UK climate modeling group. Um, and that resulted in uh, both a paper on what he observed in development of climate models uh, by the modeling group, and also a fairly understandable talk on YouTube uh, on what he observed on the, the methodology that is being used, which is not exactly what computer scientists might have expected. Yeah, yes, Vic, uh, it's becoming more eccentric politically, but. Uh, not orbitally. Just calculating global warming gives you a number uh, of how the surface temperature is uh, changing. But that doesn't really say anything about how the planet is responding to the energy accumulation. Um, the planet, for its own reasons, um, can increase the surface temperature, or it can melt ice, or store energy into the deep oceans. Um, and only the first, increasing the sem uh, surface temperature, uh, brings things back into an energy balance where the Earth is emitting as much radiation as it's receiving. Um, now, melting ice, particularly sea ice, um, decreases the albedo, the reflection of sunlight by the Earth. Instead, the open seawater absorbs energy, and that's going also um, act as a feedback. So a positive feedback in the sense that you melt the ice because of the increased CO2 um, and the energy imbalance. And 
now the Earth receives or keeps more of the energy it receives. So that increases the heating. Well, Vic, um, about 40% of the CO2 we, we release into the atmosphere has been absorbed by the ocean. That also acidifies the ocean, which is one of the problems. Um, and as the temperature of the ocean increases, it can hold less CO2. So that certainly uh, is an issue of how long will the ocean keep absorbing the, uh, the CO2. We've heated the Earth. There are patterns to how that heating occurs. And both the atmospheric circulation and the ocean circulation um, read, uh, distribute that heat because um, it's not e uh, even. More heat is received at the tropics than in the Arctic. And um, now as an effect of the global warming, the Arctic is heating up about twice as fast as the temperate and tropical zones. Um, changing the circulation can change the amount and location of precipitation, meaning rain and snow. And um, warmer water can increase the evaporation, um, increasing rain, making a storm more intense. Um, at the same time, the changing patterns uh, can lead to drought in other areas. So that if the precipitation moves, what was an agricultural area may not receive enough rain. And the rain may have shifted to a different soil type, not as good for current crops. So that's one of the side effects. Um, climate models are also used now um, in sort of a new science uh, of attribution, how climate change may have contributed to extreme events. It's, it's somewhat salty soda pop, though. So. There's a new and increasing science of probabilistic event attribution, where for a um, post-analysis of a particular event, uh, one could run an ensemble, meaning a whole collection of slightly perturbed weather model, um, and look at the pro both with and without increases in greenhouse gases and then look at the change in probability. Um, that would be true for a particular event that you'd use a weather model. And in fact, that's what do is done with weather, weather modeling now, is running an ensemble of slightly perturbed um, runs and then looking at what might occur. Um, and the probability of the event is in uh, compared for the two sets of runs and allows making a statement of how climate change um, may have changed the probability of such an event or in practical terms for humans, the risk. And insurance companies and banks are reevaluating um, such risks.
there's a uh, recent two-volume fourth U.S. assessment um, that's been released. Uh, both volumes are online, and uh, I have the uh, URLs here, and uh, these slides will <clears throat> be made available. So, um, these contain, you know, more than I put out in the talk, far more, um, on both the science of climate change um, and on the impacts, risks, and adaptation in the United States. And while preparing this, I uh, uh, ran across a TED uh, talk by uh, Gavin Schmidt, um, who was at um, uh, NASA, um, or still is, I think, um, and gives a nice short review of emergent processes uh, and model scale. Um, and you know, points out that all models are wrong, that every model has to be an approximation uh, to the real Earth. But um, if a model helps you understand more or with whether models predict more, um, then the model has skill. And so people talk about the usability of a model uh, in terms of its skill. Um, and this goes back, I think, to a statement by um, Tukey that all models are wrong, but some are useful. And I... okay. So that was my... Um, last slide and I'm happy to stand here and take questions as best I can. Well, um, that talk by Gavin Schmidt, let me go back one, take a minute to res the slide viewer um, preloads talks going forward. This talk is by Gavin Smith. He um, shows some nice pictures. Um, one of the things one can take from the picture is that the current climate models reproduce observed features of the circulation. Um, swirls of water vapor in the Southern Ocean, um, tropical cyclones and hurricanes. Um, this is not 
in sync with the earth um and one of the the things that um, confuses people is with weather prediction you're starting with initial conditions that are current um integrating the model forward in time and losing interest when the model no longer uh, matches the real Earth. With climate modeling, that isn't the way it's done. Um, it's essentially a weather model. The um, What's called the dynamic core is often the same, although not the climate model may have less resolution, meaning the, the grid squares are bigger. Um, But the features of the circulation in the atmosphere uh, emerge naturally from the physics of the model. Uh, uh, there's no code that says, oh, put a swirl here. Um, and if you look at a global look at the model atmosphere, and look at the observations at the same time, they look very similar. And if you were on the model Earth, I don't think you could immediately tell that um, it wasn't the real Earth. The, uh, the simulations are that good. Um, different physics parts of the model are compared with observations. For instance, um, back in 1989, uh, the uh, Atmospheric Radiation Measurement Program was started, which has multiple sites, one in Oklahoma, um, where they take um, the, at the atmospheric properties, clouds, um, weather circulation um, and the radiation so the two can be compared and there's a lot of um, validation of the model of climate models in terms of do they have the right statistics do the various parts um, when compared with observations um, agree with those observations. Um, and then it's all put together and there are features that you wouldn't get from just any single part but come from the interactions of all the parts. And uh, one reason that climate models are such a useful tool. The uh, IPCC, the International Panel on Climate Change, uh, has a chapter on how models are evaluated, and that's at that link. Yes, combining um, non-meat types of protein do get complete protein. I think corn falls in there somewhere too. That corn beans and legumes.
Any questions? Um, it is true that um, some features of the climate change are happening faster than predicted. Yes, and the um, more southern tree rings stayed accurate. Um, it was some of the uh, more northerly boreal tree rings um, that diverged from measured temperatures. Um, but for from 1980, uh, or not 1980, 18, about 1880 to um, 1960, observed temperatures and tree rings tracked very well. Well, not fires and permafrost so much, but um, permafrost melting, which can release methane. Um, it also um, is causing problems in Alaska, where permafrost is getting mushy um, with buildings. Um, becomes almost like standing in a puddle in the rain. Oh, we're doing that here. Um, it's not always the number of hurricanes, although with more energy um, that number can increase, but the intensity of hurricanes because there's more available energy. Certainly more flooding. Um, there has been a rise in sea level, and that mean and couple that with stronger storms, and you have more um, more flooding, basically in coastal cities. So far, um, there hasn't been great concern that things are going to change enough that the uh, um, methane stored at cold temperatures um, in the seabeds are going to um, activate, but um, that, of course, could depend on how extreme um, we keep emitting. There's still warning on hurricanes in the track them and that's one of the features of having monitoring satellites and if we didn't uh, keep replacing the satellites as they wear out and their orbits decay then um, we would lose that ability to give early warning. So support your local satellite launch or national satellite launch. All 
our grandchildren will probably think we were rather um, selfish, greedy, and careless. Um, not good shepherds of the planet. Yes, and uh, insurance companies are noticing increased risk, increased property loss from wildfires, from flooding, and that may make um, insurance in some places prohibitively expensive. Well, insurance companies actually do um, take out insurance policies. It's, it's a reinsurance, but so there's um, insurance companies for or for the insurance companies. Similar to uh, Christo, similar to wildfires being um, the big problem in California, particularly at, after several years of drought, um, when things become tinder dry. I'm not sure that um, it would get to the point of being a bottleneck um, with seven billion people on the earth, but um, it certainly puts a large number of people at hazard. Um, there are people who basically live on the flood plain in many countries. Um, we're also seeing tropical diseases starting to propagate northward as the uh, temperatures increase. So that's another hazard in terms of human health. Um, pine beetles have also uh, because many areas haven't seen as much of a cold snap as in history, uh, pine beetles have been able to increase their range, uh, increasing the danger of wildfires also. Um, the assessment for the whole world would be the ice PCC reports.
So the warming is changing the statistics of extreme events where it's now, they are now more biased to the hot side than um, to the cold side compared to um, historical uh, data. One interesting effect has been that the gradient between the tropics and the poles has decreased. The poles are heating faster than the tropics. Um, that means that the sort of vortex of circulation around the pole is weaker, allowing uh, outbreaks of polar air um, down into the um, 48 states. And, um, some cold winter weather, but not colder annual averages. Well, paradise in California um, burned a year ago uh, in a wildfire, but um, that's a good question. And um, probably the hardest thing to predict, predict is regional climate at this point. Vic, I think the answer to that is sort of like the correct answer for uh, chocolate or vanilla. And the answer is yes. That some places will suffer drought, lack of water. Um, the lack of food is interesting. Um, they talk about virtual water exporting and basically when you grow food or manufacture something um, it often takes water certainly growing food takes water um, and when that product or food is exported to another country it's considered as an export of virtual water And that, that movement north of, um, say, rainfall and productive areas um, is affected by soil type. Um, and it's not always the same soil type when you move 600 miles north. And that can drastically affect um, particular crops. Uh, we've developed, in a sense, specialized hybrid crops um, over the years. And 
how um, flexible those crops may be to changes in location and soil and season um, isn't clear yet. And um, as the growing season changes, the blossoming season also changes. Um, and that can screw up matches between pollinators and the crops.
Thank you all for coming. I appreciate the audience and the discussion. Um, it's always nice after preparing something uh, to um, have people to present it to and discuss it with. <laughs>